Yes. And at the end, I, I arrived to Turkey, to Istanbul. Yeah, yeah. And they saw what, uh, who I consider my mentor is Baris Checker. Yes. So I saw him the first time and uh, I said, okay, I want to follow. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I want to follow him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three, coming to you from Berlin at the IMRS Global Masters Meeting. And I'm so happy that finally I've managed to nail down a guy I've been wanting to interview for a few years on the podcast, Valerio Finocchi. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Cameron, for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here in your podcast. Oh, man. So, so we, we, this is going around in the world, eh? People love listening to the stories about the people we interview. Tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself. Where do you come from and how did you end up with this passion for rhinoplasty? Okay, so I am from Italy. I live in Rome. I work in private practice. And uh, since I was in the residency, I was in love for nose. Uh, it was so difficult surgery yeah. that uh, I was always hearing my professor saying that it's a surgery that only uh, older surgeons and expert yeah. surgeons after a lot of uh, years in the hospital can do. So I was, no, I have to learn it. I have to learn it. So I start to go around the world to see the best surgeons and I started to go to New York. I've seen uh, Dr. Tabal, Sherry Laston. Then I moved, I went to uh, Brazil. I saw other surgeons. Then I went to France. Yes. And at the end, I, I arrived to Turkey, to Istanbul. Yeah, yeah. And they saw what, uh, who I consider my mentor is Baris Checker. Yes. So I saw him the first time and uh, I said, okay, I want to follow. Yeah, this. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to follow him. And uh, I came back to Italy and uh, I didn't have any patients, you know, who wants to go and have a surgery yes. with you that yeah. you just finished the residency. Yeah. So I said to my friends, I said, okay, look, I do your surgery for free, but no, it's my first nose, but you don't have to pay anything. You just have to pay the clinic. Okay. And they were, they, they trust me. Yeah, yeah. So I put all my energy to make a good nose and I saw, I saw that there was not too bad. Yeah. And then I, I operate many friends okay. and then I start to feel more comfortable. And so are they still your friends now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is yeah, it? yeah. They're really happy. Fortunately, <laughs> I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, because I remember speaking to Fazal Payden a few years ago and he said he must do your first hundred rhinoplasties in the city. You're not gonna live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's that can be a good uh, good way to, to and, say. <laughs> and now tell me your your you've also like that this is like on the clinical side of operating, but you've also been very involved academically, even though you're in private, like publishing and yeah. I know on the on the Telegram group, the Preservation Telegram group. It's an incredible group. Tell me a little bit more about how you managed to do that in your life as well. Well, basically, um, when I was in the residency, I was uh, already writing articles. Yeah. So it was something that I was trained to to do. And and as we went forward in this, in this field, I felt that I could give some contribution. So I started to write uh, with Barish, I started to write with other colleagues, and um, we also write, I wrote some chapters of the preserve yes, structure yes, preservation yes. book. And then also in Italy during the COVID, we couldn't work. Yeah. So um, we decided with the Italian colleagues to make a book. So we uh, wrote during the COVID, yeah, yeah. wrote a big book which is, which is called The Ways of Rhinoplasty. And uh, it's just a way to show that the nose can be operated with many kind of techniques. Okay. The important is the result, of course. Yeah. Uh, and for me, the, in my end, the best technique is preservation because um, you know that now the patients are really precise. We live in the social media yes. e era, yes. Yes. so they really see all details. So as you gain confidence, it's very important to push yourself yeah. to obtain the best 
yeah. that you can do to your patient that you can give to your patient yeah. and so this is the reason why uh, i i also focus on what is academic because when you write something you think twice you think more you understand what is your mistake you, you understand how you can make it better that's why i still like to do it yeah and of course barish made this uh, telegram group because we realized that instead of being enemies between doctors it's yes. much better to stay together because you help me i help you Absolutely. and in this way we are faster yeah. we can achieve much better yeah. result if we share yeah. everything yeah. there is no jealousy there is just a lot of uh, love in this group so yeah. we really share everything and how we can but i think it's a different like generation like you were saying when when you first in your residency it's like they're saying no rhinoplasty is for the old guys etc i think it's important but at this in the same breath i think like part of the reason of having this podcast and those telegram groups is we want to teach people to operate better yeah because it's just it's distressing when patients are operated poorly and yes we all get our mistakes but yeah if we can teach people to do it it will be a good thing i want to come back to this preservation thing, just a quick question. That book that you guys have published, are you going to do a translate into English maybe? We already did. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah, And yeah. how can listeners get hold of that? Book? Yeah, yeah, I will show you. We, we are now in Berlin, so I will show you in the Congress. There is a... Okay. There is a but can they buy it online? I think yes. Uh, we have to ask to the editor because okay. I don't really know exactly, but I think it's possible. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Now, tell me, what is SPQR? Okay, the story of, uh, of SPQR is this. Mm, I get addicted to dorsal preservation, okay? And I did my first uh, 200 cases with high septal strip. Okay. My problem was that I also, I was also very precise with septum. But in some cases, the high septal deviation is... Uh, very uh, severe yes okay so if you want to fix that septum with high septal strip would be uh, a nightmare yes because yes. it will drop the dorsum because okay. there will be no support yeah okay because the l-strut uh, can become very weak yeah. and then it will collapse and okay. have a saddle nose so one day i realized after watching one lecture from if saban that uh, there was another way I could release the septum, and yes. this was the swinging door septoplast. Yes. Uh, but at that time in the Congress, nobody were, was talking about low septal strip. We were talking only about high septal yes. strip. So what happened is that I did the swinging door septoplasty, and then I removed the low septal strip, and then I made the impaction. I was so excited because I thought, oh, maybe I invented a new, a new technique. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote to Roland Daniel, Yves Saban, Boris Jagger. I wrote to everybody to say, look, I did something different. And Roland Daniel told me, look, it sounds like you did a cotton maneuver. Okay. Okay. So basically, SPQR is inspired from cotton, even yes. if I didn't know about him. Okay. <laughs> After I study everything about him, but. In that day, I didn't know yeah, anything. Yeah. But basically what we did, we improved what Kotl understood. Okay. Because the story of Kotl is that he was working in a hospital and there were there were many trauma. So when he was fixing the septum, he always saw that the nose was better because it was impacted after the trauma. And he saw that the perpendicular plate and vomer were disarticulated from quadrangular cartilage. Yes. This is how he okay. understood. Okay. 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 So basically we we are inspired from Kotl and we improve what he did. We understood that we can rotate the flap, we can make a better nose, we can change the profile. Yes, yes. Well basically it was impacting without making a lot of attention to yeah. to the aesthetic of the news. Okay. And SPQR, uh, uh, the name SPQR was uh, suggested by Roland Daniel okay. because he, say, he likes a lot the acronym 
acronym, yeah. acronym yeah. yes and uh, it means simplified preservation quick rhinoplasty yes simplified because you don't have to do difficult techniques yeah. when there is a severe deviation of the yeah. septum like for example extracorporeal septoplasty which is a great technique but it's difficult and it's a longer so mm -hmm. that's why with longer time more mm -hmm. time you need more time so that's why quick okay and uh, simplified preservation because we preserve the attachment between the dorsum and the quadrangular cartilage yeah. so uh, we really uh, preserve the T-shaped uh, unit yes. between the dorsum and the septum. Yes. yes. Okay. And 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 the Q and the R. Q just quick. Q is quick. Okay. And R rhinoplasty. Okay. So now, are they not the, this SPQR? Are there not a few other letters that come with that you have since then done, like a second version or first version or anything like that? Yeah. We we basically we understood that uh, as the flap of of the quadrangular yeah. cartilage is really powerful yeah. to change the shape and uh, the profile yeah. of the nose we realize that we can avoid to dissect sometimes yeah. the dorsum yeah. sometimes we just dissect the the cartilaginous dorsum sometimes we uh, we dissect we don't dissect the dorsum sometimes we have to dissect the dorsum so in in depending on the uh, uh, level of dissection of the soft tissue envelope we yeah. make three versions v1 okay. v2 v3 yes but the problem is that the more we go forward the, the more we understand that there is many variables yeah. so i like to to keep it simple uh, and i say v1 v2 v3 but in reality this is the results of v2a and v2b yeah. but i don't want to no no but that's fine that's fine i i find it fascinating I absolutely love using that technique it's it's Thank great you. so let's change the topic a little bit talk about a bit about revision and um preservation rhinoplasty so you obviously are very experienced in this whole thing but what are some of the mistakes that you're picking up that you see uh, people are potentially doing when it comes to preservation, especially on the septum? Yeah, the problem is uh, that first, first, most of plastic surgeons know how to do l strut septoplasty, mm -hmm. but they are not used with the swing indoor septoplasty. Yeah, yeah. So it's difficult at the beginning to switch your mind yes. to a totally different, and you feel a little bit of fear during the surgery of stress. Oh, a lot of fear sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this is the first problem. So we must uh, really uh, teach how to change this uh, this uh, yeah. mind setup. Yeah. Second is that this flap works because it creates a tension that is able to change the. Uh, joint of the dorsum the dorsal joint yes so we know that the dorsum is a joint so it's like elbow yes so we can extend this elbow right yeah because there is this flap that is bringing forward yes. the cartilage okay but the problem is that there are some blocking points yeah if we are not able to release those blocking points you pull the elbow and you think that you achieve a good result but you maybe forgot one blocking point. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. this blocking point will work every day, 24 hours, against the stitch that you put to stop the flap. So at the end, the blocking point will win yes. and the elbow will flex again. Yeah. So you can have a uh, hump recurrence. Yes. And I learned this on my skin because I had this problem. Okay. And uh, this helped me to understand much better the biodynamics of the nose. So now my percentage of uh, backward rotation and amp recurrence uh, dropped a lot. It's something really rare to yes. me now to happen. But at the beginning, I had this problem a lot. Okay. It's part of the learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes, well, it's so interesting to challenge all these things. Okay, one last topic I want to talk to you about. It's something that we we don't often speak about is like the mental side of rhinoplasty. And there, there are two areas I wanted to chat about. The one is how do you get yourself mentally 
in the right place to be in that place where everything's fluid, etc. I just think back to watching you operate in Nice. Kind of your whole world just slow down and there you were just focused doing what you do. That's the one aspect. The other aspect I want to chat about is how you handle this, the mental stress of unhappy patients. Mm. Yes. So um, about me, um, I'm a guy, I'm a sporty guy. I come from... Uh, extreme sports yeah yeah so i do kite surf uh, paragliding uh, so i like adrenaline yes so this is one one reason why <laughs> i like to be in that situation okay. okay but of course happens to me to be stressed as well yeah okay so it's very important for me that uh, the equip that i have with me yeah. is uh, is uh, the best i can have yeah so the anesthesiologist uh, has to be very good because Absolutely. I don't want to bleed. If I have bleeding coming, I cannot understand yes. what is happening. Yeah. So I need clean field. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's important that I do local anesthesia very well, but it's important also that uh, yeah. the anesthesiologist yeah, yeah. is good. Second is the the nurse, my assistant. Yeah. Uh, I work always with uh, three nurses always. Yeah. I don't change them because uh, it can it can give you a lot of stress if the uh, assistant doesn't give you the right instrument mm -hmm. or you ask an instrument and it doesn't know what the instrument has to give you. So, for example, in Nice, you you met one of my my nurse that works with me since ten years, okay. and is for me really special yeah, yeah, because I yeah. don't have to ask. Uh, he already knows before me what to yeah, it's give. It's the same me. with me. I would my sister Dawi. She's just amazing. So, so yeah, the instruments there. Eh? This give yeah. me a lot of uh, tranquility. A lot of uh, yeah. I feel I feel at home. I feel yeah. at home. I yeah. don't feel I'm in Nice. Yeah. I feel that I'm in my OR yeah. where I usually work. Yeah. It's like a soccer player. You yeah. know, if it say if we play the soccer match at home. It would be much better compared if it goes yes. to another stadium. Yeah. So the the trick is to create a home uh, environment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's it's. Uh, we always used to like. I mean, I was also very into sports, paddling at the Olympic Games and whitewater, and it's big adrenaline and stuff. But you got to get your butterflies to fly in formation. You know. Yeah. yeah that yeah. idea of it is stress, but manage your stress. Exactly. So exactly. just explain to me one last thing. How do you handle the stress of an unhappy patient? Yeah, uh, actually what I do, I uh, always explain to the patient before the surgery that there is a 5% of problems. Yes. Okay? That these problems uh, are uh, of course solvable and that are solvable with an easy retouch, which usually is about 10 to 20 minutes retouch. Uh, so the patient already goes into the into the um, this process yes uh, knowing that is something that can happen even if i am really precise i'm super uh, focused on getting the best result this can happen because yep. we work on something that is dynamic the body is dynamic the cells Absolutely. are, yeah, yeah. are yeah, yeah. Uh, awake they are living so this can happen um then i explain that if for example if i have a hump recurrence i can use a camouflage like hyaluronic acid to hide for six months the little problem and then after the hyaluronic acid reabsorb if still there is um any hump i can okay. bring them to the surgery room and make the rasp so uh, I think camouflage techniques help you to manage the stress of the patient because, uh, of course, they have a high, um, they, they want the best result. And in this area of social media, imagine, I always try to be uh, in the head of the patient. Imagine you said to all your, your friends that you went to the surgery, that you are going to the surgery. Yeah. Then you go, they want to see their nose and they see the hump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they feel stress. Absolutely. So in this way, in this way, camouflage, they 
Stay. Wait six months. Yeah. For me, six months is enough in dorsal preservation. Okay. Because most of the times I don't dissect the dorsum. Yeah. So I can even go before six months. Yeah. But I prefer to wait six months because the mucosa will be softer. The scar yeah, will be yeah, softer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For many reasons, the edema will... 80% yeah. went away. But in dorsal preservation, I can, I can anticipate a little bit the time. Usually... With other kind of surgery or techniques, we have to wait one year. Exactly, that's what they normally say with structural, it's a year before. But, but if you avoid to dissect soft tissue envelope, this is a virgin area. I yeah. can go even before. Sure. Yes, Valeria, it's great chatting to you, man. Thank you. Really, Thank you. really nice. Guys, I, I hope you've enjoyed this. I, it's, I love getting these, like the insights into the guys and what they're doing. It's, it's really great. And listen, keep doing what you do. I keep teaching like you are. It's, it's really fantastic. And on thank behalf you. of all the listeners around the world, thank you so much for, thank you. for thank your you visit today. Thank you very much, today. Cameron. It was a great moment for me. And uh, please keep doing it because I, I, I think that people love this podcast. That's cool. <laughs>